So she also is a member of the board of directors on the Point Pelee um, Park system there. And so that's a good thing too. So she's really very active in the birding world and got a lot of experience behind her. She's been writing for many, many years. She started birding when she was seven, so excellent. Um, so she's got a, quite a bit of background there to share too. And again, a great speaker to talk to us on this topic. So take it away, Marilyn. Thank you so much, Karen. It's, hmm, uh, I'm not seeing, are we all, are, are you seeing me okay? Karen? So we can see you totally. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I don't know why I can't see me. So you That's just have to, it's, uh, it would be in your sort of gallery box to the side. Yeah, yeah, I have it, uh, I have it clicked onto speaker and I'm not seeing it. But so we'll see when you how share, it works out. Yeah, when you share screen, hopefully that. Yeah, helps. It, it should fix it. Anyway, sorry, everybody. What a great crowd there is there. Um, I wish we were all in one room. That would be terrific. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be with the Edmonton Nature Club. I'm impressed by your activities. Um, wish I could. Well, maybe I don't wish I could go on the Christmas count with you because I'll be doing the Christmas count in the mountains of Mexico. And, you know, frankly, it's going to be warmer. So um, this evening, I'm going to talk a bit about Louise's background, what led her to Canada and led her to the birds, um, and illustrating the talk with photographs from her incredible archive, 26 Bankers Boxes Full at Library and Archives Canada alone. Uh, then I'll, I'm going to do a short reading on the study that propelled her into the ornithological limelight followed by more about how she developed into one of Canada's most important amateur naturalists and nature writers at a time really that when uh, women were struggling for equality. <laughs> well, as we still are. Um, after that, I would be very happy to answer your questions. I hope you have lots of questions because it's one of my favorite parts of an evening like this is, uh, is when it turns into a conversation. So just hang on for a minute because I'm going to now uh, share the screen and get my, um, 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 there we go. And I really hope I'm going to be able to see this. Otherwise, it's looking good so far. Just takes a minute. Get yourself another cup of coffee. There we are. Okay. And you should be able to see me as sort of a little elf figure in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, yes, and I we have you. Good. And I will try to, you know, not obscure whatever is on the screen. Um, so uh, it, it was a, a very strange and long and winding road that brought Louise to the log cabin in the northern Ontario woods where she would study birds for half a century. She was born into Swedish aristocracy. Her father was Chamberlain of the court of Gustav V, and her, her godmother was Queen Alexandrine of Denmark. So she had a certain pedigree. But she was raised on a vast family estate on the Baltic Sea called Svensund. Um, it was a mecca for, con for uh, conservationists. Her father and his friends created what was actually the world's second conservation area. The first was Yellowstone National Park, and the second one was the one that her father created on Carlso Island in the Baltic Sea, famous for its colonies of guillemots and razorbill ox that were um, threatened with extinction because of egg hunting and egg gathering for food and hunting. Um, so the family estate um, was enormous and it was wooded. It's where she, her father took her birding um, she learned the names of all the local birds and their calls. And as the eldest of two daughters, she expected to inherit Svenskun. She was 17. She was uh, walking in her father's footsteps, learning the ropes of managing the estate when he died very suddenly. Um, and the estate had to be sold for debts, uh, forcing Louise and her mother and her sister to move into a small apartment in Stockholm. So Louise debuted in 1912 when she was 18 at the court of King Gustav 
uh, the fifth, and you can see her, her debut photograph on the left there. But she was a very headstrong young woman, very highly principled. And when the First World War erupted in, in 1914, she turned her back on her privilege and trained as a Red Cross nurse. And after her training was complete, she was posted to a Russian POW camp where she fell in love, as one would imagine would happen, with a white Russian officer named Gleb Nikolaevich. So there's a picture on the right of Gleb and Louise, and that's her, her wedding photograph on, on the left. So Louise and Gleb married. They married actually in Sweden, and Louise followed Gleb to Archangel in the Russian Arctic. It's just inside the Arctic Circle. And that's where the white Russians were taking a last stand against the Bolsheviks. It was the last days of the Russian Civil War. The white Russians were defeated, and Gleb and Louise joined a thousand sleigh loads of refugees, soldiers, nurses, um, et cetera, racing west in the middle of February in blizzards through the snow, trying to make it to the Finnish border. And if you've seen the movie, Dr. Zhivago, that, is, that, that was kind of her moment in, in that history. They didn't make it. They were captured by the Bolsheviks and sent to a prison in Moscow, and there Gleb disappeared. Uh, Louise stayed on in Russia for another four years, working as a Red Cross nurse through the famines that came along after the revolution, but all the time she was searching for news of her husband. Louise and Gleb had always intended to emigrate to Canada, and there's kind of a story behind that, so if you want to know more about that, you can ask me, um, but mostly it was because uh, Canada was so much like Russia and Sweden, uh, but without their complicated history. In 1926, Louise ended up emigrating alone, and she ended, landed in Bonfield, Ontario. Now, I don't know what your knowledge of Ontario geography is, but it's just above Algonquin Park, which kind of takes up you know, the, the, the center of, of the province of Ontario. So she set up one of the first Red Cross outpost hospitals. And that's a picture of the hospital in, in the middle there. Um, this was a brand new initiative to try to bring health care to isolated communities in Canada. So a house was donated by the community and the Red Cross would pay for a nurse to provide the health care and the health care was free. So Louise's, the, the territories were huge. Louise's territory was 2,500 square kilometers and included 2,000 school children and their families scattered you know, through the woods and across the fields. She visited them in summer in her Model T Ford, that's it on the left, the Ford's name was Henrietta, and in the winter by dog sled. She procured the dogs, she uh, trained the dogs to mush, she taught herself uh, to handle a dog sled, and she visited all of her patients in winter by dog sled. So among Louise's mothers, was Elzir Dion, uh, who gave birth to the first quintuplets in the world to survive more than a day. Louise became the nurse in charge of the quintuplets, um, bringing them successfully through their first year uh, on her own formula of fresh air, sunshine, and soap, uh, a, a formula for good health for infants and children that she actually developed while she was in Russia. But she was so repulsed by the media circus um, around the infants. And if you know anything about the um, those quintuplets, the Dion quintuplets, you know that it was a bit of a circus. At one point, 3,000 people a day went past the sort of play area that where the where the infants were kind of on view to whoever wandered by. She quit the quints uh, shortly after their first birthday and retreated to a piece of wilderness she'd bought on one of her excursions by dog sled and where she'd hired a pair of Finnish carpenters to build her a three-room log cabin with no amenities, no running water, no electricity, um, nada, um, but a very comfortable three-room cabin. And there's the cabin on the right. Uh, this is her drawing of the cabin and it's on Pimacy Bay Pimacy Bay is kind of a little bulge in the Mattawa River, which runs between North Bay 
and the Ottawa River. And on the left there is a drawing that she did for one of her magazine articles. And the, the big arrow um, uh, points to Pimacy Bay, uh, which is, you know, kind of, as I said, halfway between the junction of the Ottawa River and the village of Mattawa and North Bay. So Louise was 40 when the quintuplets were born, and she was 41 when she left them in the care of others. She always saw that time with the de Young quintuplets, even though, you know, it, it dogged her through her whole life. That's what she was known for. But she saw that as kind of an intermezzo, a separate and completely unrelated episode that propelled her back to the life she had started out to live in Svensund, a life in nature. But for me, looking back on it now from a further remove, I, I see a single repeating refrain in the many lives that she lived. Uh, Louise watching birds in the forests of Sweden. Louise watching those tiny babies, keeping them alive. Louise watching birds on Pimacy Bay, wherever she was watching. So now I'm going to read um, an excerpt from... You know, I'm oh, I'm so bad at this. There we go. Is, is that sort of, yeah, there we are. That's my book. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from Woman Watching from a chapter called This Gentle Art. That was a phrase used by Percy Tavener, who was Dominion Ornithologist at the National Museum of National Sciences in Ottawa in the late 30s into the 40s. And he was author of the first Birds of Canada, um, a book I highly recommend. And in one of his letters to Louise, he described the study of bird, birds as this gentle art. On a cold day in late April 1945, Louise de Caroline Lawrence hiked four kilometers through dense forest to a bushy white spruce where Canada jays had woven dry sticks between a fork of branches, creating a frame for the bowl they'd shaped from last year's oak leaves bits of wasp nest and tent caterpillar cocoon. Inside were five eggs, beautifully white and spotted with olive brown, their small ends neatly turned into the bottom of the well-insulated nest. At the time, almost nothing was known about the species that is now Canada's national bird, or almost. A gregarious creature in summer, in spring it's shy about raising its young, retreating into the boreal wilderness just as Louise had retreated to her patch of forest on the Mattawa River after a hectic year as nurse in charge of the world famous Dion quintuplets. When Louise told a scientist at the National Museum in Ottawa about the Canada jay nest, he urged her to learn as much as she could about the bird's nesting habits. Thus, she wrote, armed with watch, mirror and blanket, how I wished I'd thought of a ground sheet too that day because the best spot for observation happened to be all but in the little rivulet. I set out on my first nest watching expedition with no previous experience, but much enthusiasm. The clouds hung low, pushed swiftly by a wind from the northeast. The temperature hovered just below freezing. Louise set up a flat trap, baited with suet and settled on a stump with inside of the nest holding the blanket close and sitting perfectly still, hoping the jays would accept her as part of the landscape. She smeared a nearby stick with peanut butter. The jays flew in, swallowed the peanut butter with a soft shre, and flew back to their eggs, ignoring the trap. Without the certainty of holding the bird in her hand, Louise couldn't distinguish male from female, both dark gray above, lighter gray below, a distinctive white patch on the forehead and black at the back of the neck. She assumed she was watching a mated pair. Uttering mellow notes, she wrote, they stepped around the nest and over it, apparently undecided which one of them ought to sit down on it. In growing excitement, both crouched and shivered their wings until finally one of them entered the nest and sat down on the eggs, carefully adjusting them under its brood spot. The other followed and sat down on top of the first bird, their bodies slightly crosswise. The one covering the eggs with only its head and tail showing was embedded deeply under the long fluffed feathers of the one on top. For an hour and a half, the bird sat on the eggs stacked like a double duvet, 
Heavy snow began to fall. Then the wind picked up and Louise laughed, afraid she wouldn't be able to see to find her way home. She had sat by the nest for six hours. The blizzard raged all the next day. In the afternoon, Louise waded back to her watching post. Snow was piling on top of the top bird so thickly that now and then it had to get up and shake the snow off, strutting around as if trying to warm up. Louise lasted four hours. On the fifth day of watching, Louise arrived just before sunrise. The nest had been pillaged, all the eggs taken but one, which was still warm to the touch when she clambered up the tree to check. She searched the surrounding woods and finally found the parents huddled in a white spruce, mewing and trembling their wings and opening their bills to one another. Then the birds flew off. Louise caught glimpses of them at long intervals until they disappeared altogether. After 21 hours of watching, Louise concluded that the winter nesting Canada Jays keep their eggs warm by both parents incubating together, stacked on the nest. The first time such behavior had been observed. She sent her report to the National Museum along with the carefully boxed nest containing the sole remaining egg, which was tested and found infertile. The nest and the egg were added to the collections of the nation. Two years later, five days with a pair of nesting jays appeared in the Canadian Field Naturalist, her first published study. Louise's initiation into nest watching had taken her into almost virgin territory, rich with opportunities to make a contribution and alive with controversy. Was this a mated pair or sisters at the nest? There were still questions to be answered. How could she resist? So in 1939, the day after the Second World War was declared, Louise had remarried, this time to Len Lawrence, the man she'd hired to finish the inside of the cabin and build her furniture. He introduced her to the most common forest birds using local names, woodpicks for woodpeckers, camp robbers for Canada Jays, Len enlisted almost immediately, and for the next five years, Louise lived alone in the woods. She learned to identify birds and learned their scientific names from books. Most importantly, Percy Taverner's Birds of Canada, which she's reading in the photograph there on the left, and the pocket guides by Frank Chapman and Chester Reed that were small enough that she could take them into the woods. Taverner's introduction especially touched her. There was, he said, much valuable work to be done by every sort of watcher, physiologist, behaviorist, and amateur too. Taverner's words gave Louise purpose through those long war years. She was alone for six years. Blessed be these birds, she wrote to Taverner. With them, it's quite impossible to feel one instant of loneliness or boredom. From the beginning, though, Louise wasn't satisfied with just watching. I feel I need an aim, she wrote to Taverner. How can I do more, study better, know, know more, and let it come to use for all our knowledge? Why not take up banding, he said. I don't think anyone can really know a bird until they've held it in their hand. And so for 17 years, from 1942 to 1959, Louise operated the most northerly banding station in Ontario. She found plans and built herself a simple flat trap. Um, and that's a drawing on, on the sort of upper left there of her flat trap and the string that uh, went from the flat trap uh, through the chinking in the log cabin to her kitchen table where she would sit and watch until a bird wandered under her trap. Over those 17 years, she banded 2,628 individual birds in 50 species. But few of her birds were found, I think only eight, um, but they were invaluable to her studies, especially her nest watches, where the bands differentiated male from female, a lesson she had learned to pay close attention to during that first study with the Canada Jays. And banding taught her more than that. In order to catch a bird, she had to know what it ate, whether it was a tree creeper or a ground feeder, shy or curious, all of which determined which kind of trap to use and how to bait it. And this, of course, was long before mist nets and, uh, 
and a much simplified way of banding. But there was so much to learn. Bird studying has such scope that I feel one must limit oneself, she wrote to Tavener. From the things I've lately read about, about the different ways of learning about bird life, it seems that a well-conducted regional study over a period of years is a field that has been little explored. And that was true. And that's what she did. For the next 50 years, she watched the birds on this little plot of land. And on the right, you can see her hand-drawn map of, um, of her property. So the highway goes across the bottom there. And the side is Pimacy Bay. And the northern shore is the Mattawa River. <laughs> This particular map is of uh, territories of the red-eyed vireos on her property. And you'll notice that, that the territory is sort of a large oval. And within that, there are two smaller circles, uh, one with one dot, which is a larger circle, and that's the singing area. And the smaller circle with two dots in it is the nesting area. And then on the left is one of the thousands of data cards that are still in the Library and Archives Canada, um, she kept track of absolutely every detail of every bird that she was watching. So uh, Louise's first published study, which I mentioned, and, and here's her drawing of, of those two Canada Jays um, and the way she saw them on the nest. Um, that first uh, drawing, uh, sorry, that first study of Canada Jays was followed by a comparative study of the nesting behavior of chestnut-sided and Nashville warblers. That was published in the AUK, which represented a major step forward for her from a Canadian publication to, to, um, to a, a North American publication. The AUK was the official journal of the American Society of Ornithologists. So what intrigued Louise about these two warbler species was the difference between their nests. The Nashville warbler uh, on the left built directly on the ground. It shaped its nest from rootlets and fine fibers and it hid it under a thatch of leaves. The coloring of the Nashville was so like the forest floor that Louise had a hard time seeing it um, unless she noticed a bit of movement or the gleam of an eye. The chestnut sided on the other hand, on, on the right, I better move, um, hung the nest about a half a meter off the ground and used fine grasses and strips of birch bark to create a perfect camouflage in the dappled light um, of the understory. So Louise observed the birds through nest building, incubation, hatching until the baby birds fledged. She noticed that the Nashville, this is, she noticed such curious things. She noticed that the Nashville always faced south when, it's, when she sat on her eggs and always headed east when she left the nest. And no matter where she went when she took her break, she always returned from the east too, which I found really fascinating. Um, so the chestnut sided's nest contained four creamy eggs and the Nashville nest contained four of the blue white eggs with the little cinnamon spots um, that are, are typical <clears throat> of the Nashville. But it also contained one very large gray freckled uh, cowbird egg. Uh, this is a picture of a cowbird and a warbler, but obviously that's a Wilson's warbler and not, not a, a Nashville. Um, but cowbirds at the time, even though I don't know what kind of a population there is in Edmonton, but certainly in Ontario, cowbirds are, are everywhere. They're, they're absent, but at the time they were new. Um, so when that, the young hatch, the Nashville parents, these poor little parents, fed all the, nest, uh, the nestlings and they fed them absolutely equally, um, despite the fact that the cowbird was twice as big as the others. And even when the cowbird stretched out its neck and fluttered its wings and begged, still the parents kept to, you know, equal food for each of the five birds. Um, on three occasions, the parents actually pulled the food out of the cowbird's mouth and gave it to their natural offspring. And, and often the female would stand on top of the cowbird um, as she fed the warblers, uh, throwing her whole body into keeping the, the, the giant subdued while, while her babies could eat. And more than once, uh, she watched and cheered as, as that little female would tug at a wing or a leg 
of one of her chicks rescuing it from under the, that uh, parasite bird. So Louise banded the young chestnut-sided chicks when they were eight days old, the day before they left the nest, and she banded, weighed, and measured the Nashville chicks when they were seven days old and the cowbird was eight. The next day, um, when she arrived, all the young had flown. Um, the cowbird, which was twice as big as the uh, warblers by that time, as well as the little warblers. Louise had a special interest in warblers, um, as so many of us do. It's hard not to be interested in those beautiful little songsters. But she was interested in part because their numbers were already falling through the 1940s. 15 years before Rachel Carson's Silent Spring was published, Louise charted the decline of 13 species of warblers in her forest. Her local population um, of, of each of those species dropped by more than 10% over that decade, which might be explained by changing, changing forests, changing food supply, et cetera. But three of the birds, the chestnut sided, the morning warbler and the Canada warblers, dropped by an astonishing 75%. She suspected that the depopulation was linked to the roadside spraying of toxic chemicals. And since this was the era of DDT, um, she, you know, there was much chat, uh, not on, not on, uh, not on Twitter, uh, but through good old Canada Post about the possibilities of toxic sprays accounting for the rapid bird decline. So in 1952, she set out to uh, to uh, do a, a study uh, of hydro right of ways that were being sprayed and that weren't being sprayed. So she compared the two areas. Her, her study um, right of way initially contained five pairs of yellow throats, four pairs of indigo buntings, two pairs of morning warblers, and a single pair of um, song sparrows. The area was sprayed twice over the summer, the second time very heavily. After spraying, repeated counts showed only one pair of yellow throats and a single male indigo bunting. No morning warblers, no song sparrows. Other hydro cuts and roadsides where there, that weren't sprayed showed birds in their usual abundance. So this was, uh, this was a remarkable study. A decade later, when Rachel Carson took up that same challenge based on the uh, experience of, of uh, bird decline of, of a friend of hers, she took up the challenge to prove the link between chemical use and bird population decline. She used the data from an army of watchers like Louise who had been recording this decline for years. Louise shared her data with um, her annual population data and, and all of her study data with ornithologists at the National Museum in Ottawa and also at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. But she also shared it as did so many amateurs across the continent with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. And that's where Rachel Carson gathered many of her statistics. So it's more than likely that Rachel Carson added Louise's numbers to prove her argument that toxic chemicals were causing the degradation of the environment and killing birds. Now we all know, I'm sure all of us birders know, that since 1970, another 3 billion birds have been lost. But what we sometimes forget is that that is on top of the millions lost in the decades before when only the amateurs were counting the declines in their small patches of forest across the continent. So now we can lay the blame for um, most of that decline at the feet of humans, our polluting ways and our greed for urban land. But at the time, Louise was puzzled by what she saw. They didn't, birders at the time, didn't have the advantage of the broad perspective that we have now. More than anything though, it was those unanswered questions that intrigued her. Why did chickadees sing so lustily in January far outside their breeding season? Why did small birds nest within sight of the nest of merlins, one of their most deadly predators? What was the reproduction cycle of the red crossbill and the life history of the yellow-bellied sapsucker? Wilderness birds about which 
almost nothing was known at the time. And what was the Norther Frickard saying exactly when it thrust its bills into the air and moved its head side to side? And that's what this slide is about. It shows the social aggressive display of the flicker. <clears throat> Above is a low intensity display. Notice how the tail is just slightly angled. Um, it's spread, but it's only half twisted. Um, they're pointing their, their bills at each other, but just, just making the bills move in small little circles or in little figure eights. Below it, um, <laughs> where should I go? I guess I go over here. Below it um, is a high intensity display. The, the tail is completely um, folded over. The wings are completely open so that you can see the, um, the yellow shafts. And, and the, the head is bobbing dramatically in, in back and forth and, and in very large circles. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there was no money in scientific studies. Um, so to support herself, Louise wrote popular articles based on what she was learning through her observations. She became a regular contributor to Audubon and Nature magazines. In fact, she, to this day remains the largest contributor to Audubon magazine over the life of its history. She taught herself to draw in order to earn a few more dollars uh, to illustrate her articles. So the, you can see the one in the middle, the illustration in the middle there of the, of the Merlin uh, was a drawing that she did. She was very good. On, on the left is uh, our, our nests and uh, bird skins from uh, the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, meanwhile, while she was writing popular articles and scientific journal articles, she was shaping her observations into narratives that became books. The Log House Nest there on the top left in 1945, The Lovely and the Wild on the far left, this won the John Burroughs Medal. She was the first Canadian woman to be awarded that prize and only the fourth woman to begin to win it since it began in the, uh, oh goodness, I think it was in the late 1800s. Rachel Carson won it for Silent Spring in 1965, and Louise won it in 1969 for her memoir of Living with the Birds. Louise continued, that's Louise, her typewriter in, in the middle. Louise continued to watch birds and right through her 80s, publishing the story of her Russian love and loss, Another Winter, Another Spring, at the age of 83, and her last book, To Whom the Wilderness Speaks, at 86. The year she turned 90, she, she published her um, last scientific article, uh, which was a, a poignant description of the mating cycle of the downy woodpecker for Living Bird Quarterly, which still exists, one of my favorite magazines. And the following year at 91, her final bird story for Audubon. So altogether, six books and almost 100 articles for scientific and popular magazines. So well into her 90s, Louise continued her daily bird walk at dawn, keeping notes on every bird she saw, the, the weather conditions, arrival and departure dates, nesting, migration, all the behaviors of birds that fascinated her. I know of no occupation so fulfilling as that of becoming a watcher, she wrote in The Lovely in the Wild. The observing self is pushed into the background and obliterated except for a cramped leg or an aching muscle imposed by enforced immobility. All senses are focused upon the amazing events that are constantly taking place. The Dion quintuplets were Louise's first scientific experiment, the testing of her theory that sunlight, fresh air, and cleanliness were key to health, even in the most compromised newborns. She extrapolated from her year with the quints to the appalling child mortality rate in Canada at that time and how it might be reduced. Her mind moved naturally from the particular to the general, from the specifics of close scientific observation to what was universally significant in what she saw. Her first book, 
the quintuplets first year, proved to Louise she wasn't only a nurse, she was a, an observer and a writer, one who had just written her first life history. And when she moved to birds, she trained herself in ornithology and wrote life histories of birds whose lives were unknown at the time. The first studies of the Canada Jay, the Red Crossbill, the Yellow-Bellied Sapsucker, and woodpecker studies that are still cited on, on the Cornell All About Birds uh, website, and also Hinterland Who's Who, which my kids grew up with and still exists out there, folks. It's quite amazing. <laughs> We may think that we know everything there is to know about how birds are, which was the task that we set herself. But according to Bob Montgomery, a Kingston bird scientist and the science reader from my book, one of the authors of 10,000 Birds, there are modern life histories for maybe a third of the, bird, of the world's 10,000 species. And only about half of those are anywhere near comprehensive. He says that it's reasonable to say that they're only 10 to 20% of the world's bird species that have been well studied, which is pretty astonishing in this age of Google when we think we know just about everything. Louise called herself an amateur ornithological naturalist, and today she might be called a citizen scientist, though self-trained scientist I think is more accurate. Amateurs like her have always contributed significantly to the natural sciences, and we continue to do so through bird apps like eBird that are creating amazingly accurate maps of the range of migration patterns of more than 600 species. Jennifer Ackerman in this book, The Bird Way, many of you probably have read her books there, just I can't recommend them highly enough. She wrote in this book, scientists traditionally have had little use for anecdotal evidence, demanding data that can be replicated or manipulated statistically. But a single observation by a competent and honest observer of a bird doing something exceptional can offer a rare window into a bird's flexibility of mind. So I knew Louise when uh, we both lived in our separate patches of woods near North Bay. The last time we were together in her log house, we stood looking at the big windows with their view through the trees of Pimacy Bay, and she said, you can't imagine how it feels to have one question after another solved about how birds live. When I think of it now, I realize what a mammoth job it was. It's a pity I couldn't finish it. In 1989, when she was 95 and I was 40, I wrote a profile of her for Harrow Smith Magazine, which you may remember, that magazine. She liked it so much she asked me to be her biographer. Sure, I said, which is... <laughs> my usual response in this life of mine, not really ever knowing what I was signing up for. Louise died in 1992, 30 years ago this spring. And through those decades since, I've, I've often thought about how I would fulfill my promise to her. Um, if I was to write about Louise, I wanted the reader to get to know her the way I had through her own voice. Luckily, I had thousands of letters and all her published studies, so I had a lot of her voice to draw on. But as I sorted through all that material, I realized that I wanted to share that process with the reader. I wanted to bear the bones of biography. I wanted to take the reader into the reading room of Library and Archives Canada, that's it on the upper right, in Ottawa. I wanted to show them the bird vaults in at the ROM, where I was surrounded by cabinets filled with 140,000 dead birds. And that's the cabinet there, sort of in the middle. I wanted to share with them the ethical dilemmas of telling the story, the life history of someone I knew only at the end of her life, and the discomfort that I felt prying into private nooks that no one except her mother saw. And, and sometimes she didn't even share these things with her mother. I came to see the book as part memoir, a memoir of the writing of the book, but also a memoir of my own life with birds, which is a thin thread woven through the book. Like Louise, I've been watching birds since I was a little girl, but it wasn't until 10 years ago when I started living half the year in Mexico in the wintering grounds of, of some of the songbirds that, that I listened to in the spring in their breeding grounds 
that I became intensely aware of the birds' migrations and what that might mean to them. And of my own migrations, I grew up in South America. I live now in Mexico half the year and in Canada. So my own North-South migrations and of Louise's migrations east-west to Sweden and Russia and Canada and what that might have meant to her. So finally, I could see my way to writing the life of this remarkable woman, stories lifted from her letters and speeches and research studies told in her words, the birds of my childhood and my birds of the South interfeathered with hers of the North and the entire process visible beginning to end. And where this story ends is with me living in her log house nest to write the final chapter of the book. And that's that's a picture of her of her house as it existed uh, two years ago when I was living there. Um, and and her uh, her her the um, Matawa River, where I canoed up to Talon Chute, uh, past the high cliffs that she used to watch birds on. And then on the far right is uh, is her living room, her fireplace, um, and my manuscript laid out in front of it as I sought to turn it into, into something worthy of your read. <laughs> um, I walked the same paths that she walked. I paused to take in the same views I noted the birds that were passing through on their way south and those that remained, everything that was different and so much that was still the same. So I want to thank you for listening. Uh, if you'd like to hear Louise's voice, if you haven't done so already, I hope you'll go to my website, MarilynSimons.com, and watch the Women Watching uh, video. Uh, go to the woman watching page and watch and there's a, a link on the left side to a short documentary on Louise made by my granddaughter Alice Moore with sound by her uncle Carl Moore and the sound is from some of my in original interview tapes with Louise which my wonderful son uh, Carl uh, managed to master so that uh, she sounds just exactly the way she always used to so now I would be very happy to answer uh, your questions, if I can, about Louise, about the book, about how I came to write it, about living in her log cabin. Um, just, you know, I'm, I'll pretty much answer anything. So I am going to now unshare the screen so um, you can see me fully. Okay, here we go. Uh, oh, no, that's not how I do it. Darn. Okay, that's not it. How do I do it? Oh, up here. Okay, sorry. I do that wrong every time. Okay. <laughs> um, unfortunately, for some reason, I still can't. Oh, there, I can see myself. All right. Uh, not that I want to see myself. I want to see you. So uh, if you have questions, please do uh, ask me. Um, and uh, when I read out your question, uh, and I gather the questions will all be... Uh, Yes, we'll, we'll all be in the chat, so that's good. And, uh, you know, if you want to talk to me, we can, you could show yourself. I would love to see you. Um, all right, so the first question is from Brenda Pullen, who wants to know what happened to her first, to her first uh, husband. Well, he came back. Uh, he came back from the war. Uh, he's, he was a wonderful help to her through all of her, um, all of her studies. Uh, he was an uneducated man who had never traveled anywhere. He was very much a northerner. He was kind of a jack of all trades. Um, he earned a, a small living working part time, uh, plowing the roads in winter and grading them in the summer, as so many uh, northerners do, cobbled together a living however they could. Um, they were. He died before she did. He died um, five years before she did. Um, and, and it was a great sorrow to her. Um, I just wanna make sure I, yes, okay, good. Um, and uh, Janice Hurlbert asked a question that is very much on, uh, on people's minds right now, that she's ordered the book from Audrey's, um, but they say it may take a while. Yes, the first printing is sold out and because of supply chain issues, how often have you heard that? Um, 
it, the, the, the second printing has taken a great deal of time to arrive, but they say it will be here um, by the first week of December. Um, in the meantime, if you go to my Facebook page, um, I am offering a free audiobook to people who um, send an email to the uh, to the to the email that I mentioned there. So, if if you're up for an audiobook in the meantime, before you get the paper book, um, go ahead and send me an email, and I'll see what I can do. Um, Yes, and that's the best way to order the book is through your local independent. They will get it as fast as anybody. Um, okay, Dave, Ely, do you know where Louise's bird recoveries were found? Yes, I do. Uh, the question will be, can I remember it? Um, okay, um, I know that uh, one bird was found in West Virginia. Uh, one was found in Quebec. Two were found near Sault Ste. Marie. One was found near Duluth. So that's five. I think there were only six or seven, um, but they, they weren't terribly far away. Um, I, was, I was kind of surprised. Um, and she was disappointed, you know, that, that she hadn't, uh, you know, that more of her birds weren't, weren't found. So she would get a sense of where they had, where they had gone to. So Elizabeth uh, Bobien has read Mar. I think I heard you talking about it at the very beginning before we began. Um, so the Edmonton Public Library has not heard of it. I'm not surprised. One of Louise's great frustrations when she was writing was how few books sold in Canada. Because her books were published in the United States and, and published in Canada by subsidiaries, they, they didn't even seem to know she was Canadian. They did no promotion. They did nothing. So her books are not easy to find. That's for sure. Um, so, however, the paperbacks of most of her books, I think with the exception of The Lovely in the Wild, uh, can still be bought uh, online from Dundurn Press, D-U-N-D-U-R-N. So if you go to Dun Dundurn Books, I don't know if it's Dunburn Press or Dundurn Books, um, they, I, I'm pretty sure they still are selling Mar. Um, and of course, they're, they're all, I think, I think most of them are available as eBooks. And the other thing I would recommend is go to Abe Books, A-B-E Books. Um, I noticed they have a lot of her books. I've been able to get first editions of, of all of her books because I, I had paperbacks. I didn't have first editions before I started writing the book, and I definitely wanted that. Dave Ely, did Louise have a favorite bird? Well, um, you know, I think if you asked her that question, she would say no. Um, she loved every bird, you know, and and she would get excited whatever her current bird was that, that you know that she was watching. Um, but, but the bird that sort of, I think was most responsible for turning her into, in, in, into a really good observer and a good nature writer was the cardinal. So in 1940, when she saw her first cardinal, they were very, very rare that far north. So she wrote to Taverner and Taverner said, yeah, um, uh, this isn't the most northerly sighting. They've been seen in New Liskard. Um, but she had, when she wrote to him, she said, oh, I saw this, this vision of red flitting through the woods and, the, and, and it looked like a scrap of red flannel. And so he, was, he said, you know, you're quite sentimental in the way you, you talk about birds. I want you to write a paragraph about the, about the cardinal that anyone who knows the cardinal would recognize it as a cardinal, and she did that, and with his with his um, mentoring and his tutelage, and constantly sending back her writing, um, she became a very very clear, and yet still quite poetic, um, right nature writer. Um, anyway, so I I know she loved the cardinal. 
She also loved, she did say in one of her letters to Margaret Morse Nice, she said that the red-eyed vireo was one of her favorite birds. She loved its song. And one of her, <clears throat> one of the uh, studies for which she's most well known is her, her um, dawn to dusk bird song count of the red-eyed vireo. She watched that bird from, <clears throat> I think it was 20 after four in the morning. And she started at three to make sure she wouldn't miss its first call until um, until around 6.30 at night. It was 14 hours of, of watching. And she tracked that bird, you know, through. she had her lunch with her. She stopped to pee when she had to, but she tracked that bird without stopping for six, 14 hours. 22,197 songs. And that record, and this is no surprise, has never been broken. And, and, and you will still find it in, in the bird books. I, I, I bought a bird book called Extreme Birds, and, and there was a whole section on Louise and the Red Eyed Vireo. So. so, Brian Stevens, okay, see? Every, oh, no, sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Who is the audiobook narrated by? I don't remember. Her first name is Elizabeth. Oh, it might be Elizabeth Wiley. And, and the book won an award from Audiophile. Um, and it's quite good. I don't have any say in, in who it is, um, but I listened to it recently, and it's, it's really quite good. Why did Greg Bounds wants to know why I chose to write this book? Well, you know, because Louise asked me to, and uh, I felt, you know, I I was a very close friend of Louise's, and I've always loved older women, and she was one of my old ladies, and I was I was I was very very moved by her resourcefulness and her resilience and her dedication and her, her honesty. She was like the most forthright person you could ever meet. And she always spoke slowly, unlike me. And she always paused before she spoke. In, and, and you knew that what she was saying was what she really believed. And how often does that happen? You know, it's, it's far too rare. I didn't write it until now because I didn't know how to do it. And I, I know I've, I've written both fiction and nonfiction, um, narrative nonfiction. And I've, I tend to write rather experimental books, as my editor used to say. She could, always count on, she could always count on me never to write the same book twice. But I had no idea how to write a biography. And I really did not want to write a standard biography where I was supposed to be the know-it-all who knew everything about, about this person. I wanted her to tell her own story. And it just took me a really long time to figure out how to do that. But once I did start it, it didn't take me very long. It was it was amazing. I, uh, yeah, it was really quite a lot of fun. Um, another, I noticed on her life list, this is the this is the one, Brian Stevens, you have stumped me. I noticed on her life list, there was a bird called Maryland Warbler. She did not have it checked. Do you know what this is called now? Somebody quick get on Google and, and figure it out. I, I was trying to do that and I can't find, uh, um, it, there's a dictionary entry for it in the Merriam-Webster dictionary. It just says it's a warbler. Yeah, that's, well, that that's helpful. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Oh, you know what? I wonder if it's a Cape May warbler. Maybe, yeah. Because like, Cape May is in, is in Maryland, right? Yeah. I have I, been, uh, it, that, that might be it. Um, I should look on her life list and see if there's a Cape May, because as you know, <coughs> you can also look on, I think, Sora, you know, S-O-R-A, mm -hmm. and they have the, I think it's Sora that has the, um, the uh, American Ornithological Society's, um, all the, you know, previous versions of oh. their bird lists. And you might you might be able to find it on there because that life list is probably probably dates from the fifties or sixties. Because right, I happen to have um, a friend of mine passed on to me 
one of the um, little uh, books by Reed, the Birds of East of the Rockies. Oh, yeah. Um, I didn't think I should look in that one and see if it's in there. Yeah, and, and you could all, I, you know, I, actually, I will look and I will write to Karen and tell her what I find. But I have, um, I have the Chester Reed book. And I also have the um, Taverners uh, 1934 Birds of Canada and um, Earl Godfrey's uh, 1966 Birds of Canada. And so I'll look in those and see if there's a Maryland Warbird. But my bet is it's a Cape May um, that whose who's, um, who's, uh, range does not normally extend up to that area, but she actually saw a Cape May. Um, and it was it was the first sighting of a Cape May um, that far north. So so yeah, so 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 that is to be determined. And um, let's stay in touch and I'll see what I can find out. Sure. Or if anybody else finds it, just submit it through the ENC uh, Bird Studies site communication to me and um, I will basically, once I get the information, disseminate it to everybody. And will you send it to me too, Karen? Please? You bet. If I get it, okay. I'll get it. Or if you beat us to it. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I'm going to be going down like in about whenever we finish here, because I'm very curious. So Fiona, you ask me, uh, how did I first meet Louise? Um, yes, I do remember it. And it's in the book. Um, so I, I had, I knew about her. Because in Northern Ontario in the early 70s, there were not, you know, writers were pretty thin on the ground, shall we say. So I knew about her. People had told me, oh, yeah, she's a writer, too. I was just working on my first book at the time. Um, but I when um, To Whom the Wilderness Speaks comes out, which was her last book, I went to the book launch at the North Bay Public Library. Uh, I lived south of North Bay. And our, but our, and she lived east of North Bay, but our forests made a, a continuous forest highway. Um, but more about that in a minute. Um, and so anyway, I went, I went to the book launch and I took the book to her and, uh, you know, the place was packed. There were a hundred people there, but still she found time to talk to me briefly and we made a connection and I arranged to come and visit her. And, and that's how we met. So at the time she was, I am what, hmm, 86? Yes, I think she was 86. Um, no, 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 I'm wrong. She was 80. No. She was, eight, sorry. <laughs> sorry, this is no fun for you. Um, she was 86. It was 1980 and she was 86 because she was born in 1894. Um, so, uh, we, we started meeting, I would go to visit her. And in 1983, I don't know if you remember the slide uh, that had her life list on it. It also had a yellow bird, a, a solidly yellow bird. Well, that, that was a, a leucistic evening grosbeak, a pure yellow evening grosbeak. And that grosbeak showed up on her feeder and when I when I was going through her her bird notes and I saw that bird on her bird notes and, and it, she talked about it in some of her letters, I thought I saw that bird. And luckily, I'm a hoarder. So I have all my diaries back to the age of seven. And I looked in in my diary for that year. And sure enough, I had seen that same bird a couple of days after she saw it. So that's how that's how this book begins is with that that common sighting of those two birds. So, oh, somebody's got an answer already. you yeah, got, got two of them there. It's yeah, Maryland ground warbler. It's a common yellow throat. Huh. Well, isn't that interesting? In, in the Reed one in 1928 was when it was published. It calls it a Maryland yellow throat. But oh. 1890, it's a Maryland yellow warbler. So, huh. yeah. Oh, don't you just love this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and now they're like, you know, as as they're able to do genetic studies on, on these birds, they're splitting them more and more finely, 
right in, into in into uh you know different uh naming them separately I, I was just thinking of of the research that they're doing now uh, somebody was telling me about on the on the wood thrush right which is um decreasing in my part of the world and in the uh atlantic seaboard even though the forest cover is increasing but the bird is increasing more in the center, you know, sort of Indiana, um, Illinois, you know, that sort of area. Um, and, and this, anyway, and, and, and do, doing genetic, you know, um, DNA studies on it, they're, they're finding that there are several varieties. So it's, uh, yeah, very interesting. Oh, lots of people, lots of people picking up on that Maryland yellow throat. We're all a bunch of researchers. Well, and you know, Louise wasn't that uncommon. Um, I mean, she was and she wasn't. I mean, her background was uncommon. Her, her single-mindedness, her obsessiveness, her resourcefulness, that was uncommon. But there were all kinds of people tramping through the woods and lots and lots of women. And I do have um, a chapter in the book on, on uh, women watchers, the, the sort of the the, the lineage of women watchers that she stepped into when she started watching birds and, and the, the difference in, in how women watch birds, which I, I think is legitimate. And, and women were, I mean, a woman wrote the very first bird guide. Um, a, you know, a, a woman wrote the first nature writing. That was Susan uh, Fenimore Cooper. Um, in Canada, there were there were women uh, that one of the first bird studies that we know of was 1835. Um, so by a woman uh, who was refuting <laughs> refuting the claim of a of a French um, a, a French naturalist who said that Canadian birds don't sing. Um, and and so you know. Uh, um, Oh, you know, her name is Escapement, but this woman, Elizabeth somebody, um, lived near near um, Quebec and in, in one of the major flyways. And every spring, I mean, she heard birds like singing like crazy, right? So she, she wrote a, a, a disquisition on seven uh, songbirds um, and that is, is quite wonderful. Anyway, it's, uh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> uh, so, so, so she, you know, and, and out West, uh, one of the, one of the women watchers that I write about is Elsie Castles that um, probably many of you know about who, um, who was from Red Deer and started a, a, a nature preserve there. And she didn't, she didn't write. She kept amazing data for decades and decades. Uh, she didn't write, but she gave talks all over the province about about birds and the, the the necessity for conservation. Unfortunately, when she died, her husband destroyed all of her notes, all of her bird data. So that's a sad story. But um, but she was a remarkable woman. Um, so, are there any more questions, or have we exhausted this topic? Nice, nice, nice uh, thumbs ups and hearts. And that's lovely. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Marilyn. Uh, that was awesome, you know, talking about this lady to us. She she was a very remarkable woman. And I do remember reading some of her books when I was much younger um, and they were good. And yeah. so it was kind of nice to have that back again and, and hear more about her life, which um, I was not aware of too. And, you know, and hearing about your experiences as well. So that was awesome. And thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. Um, I just wish I could be there in person. And if I ever give up, get up to uh, Edmonton, I'll maybe join you on one of your bird walks. Sounds good. So thank you. Uh, we'll end it at that. 